Welcome to episode 250 of Not The Footy Show. I'm Warwick Nicholson. i got Rob Cox on the line, and it wouldn't be Not The Footy Show if we didn't start our season six rounds late. Is that right, Cocksmith? Well, so, like, uh, you know, like the, the greats do, we come in late, right? We make a big entrance, come in at round six, peak for origin, and then just fizzle out for the rest of the year. Actually, I think the last couple of years we've, we've finished strongly more so than okay. uh, fizzled out, to be fair. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, we've, we've sort of taken a bit of a hiatus, uh, a bunch of reasons, but effectively um, we thought we'd better pull our fingers out and give you a podcast for season 2022. This is episode 250, which is somewhat of a milestone. So we figured we might as well, uh, you know, wait till all the stars are aligned to uh, give you a new episode. Uh, speaking of stars aligning, Cocksmith, the Tigers. <laughs> How good are they going? The Tigers aligned yesterday for the first time in a long time. Uh, they were pretty good, mate. I was at the game and, um, yeah, it was it was uh, impressive. The, Tiger, the, the Eels didn't play bad. No, um, they didn't. 21-20 was the score. And uh, I was driving along somewhere uh, three or four weeks ago and uh, my podcast, the way I have to edit the show is I add it to my iTunes library and then it goes into podcasts, etc. So that means that occasionally there'll be a episode of the podcast in my shuffle of songs and it was the episode we did last year on your birthday happy birthday what's coming up yeah um which was on anzac day uh and we just got through the fact that the tigers had been beaten by manly i think this time last year by like 50 points it was the first game where tommy went absolutely nuts and we sat there and the tigers were one and six and we said how long before he gets sacked Mm. well if we'd done this podcast three days ago um, we would have been having the exact same discussion and uh, Madge would have been none from five. He's now one from five, Doc Smith, which uh, if I have a look at the stats, says that he was one from five this time last year. But the first two years, he was three and three. Um, he survived three pretty ordinary seasons. What's he got to do to, to, to capitalise on this win and uh, hold on to that job at Tiger Town? Well, he's got to keep winning, mate. And, and I'm, not sure, I'm not sure they're going to keep winning. Like yeah. yesterday was pretty impressive, um, and 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 unfortunately for the Tigers or for the players, it showed everyone what they've got when they have a dig. I hope they keep. I, I hope they keep going. As you know, and as I've said, you know, a hundred times on this show, I really like the Tigers. Um, I want to support the Tigers. I, I want to follow the Tigers. I want. I want to be excited about them. But look, it, it as as it came, you know, like like. You know, like the sun comes up every day, we can rely on that. But I can't. I don't know if we can rely on on the Tigers performing like they did yesterday for the rest of the year. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm in two minds. I I hope they do. I you know, but watch this space. I, the interesting thing is, is that still, if you take Madge's last twenty six games, you know, one season's worth of games, it's a still he still has a better record than Anthony Griffin. And Madge is under all the pressure. I was wondering how long we get to the Dragons. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know, and I mean, I know the I know the Dragons won on the weekend, but let's not um, let's not get off the Tigers too early because they they did really well. Like they they hung in there, and and you know, the Tigers have in situations like that have given up in the past when when a team starts to come back at them. You know, um, so I, I was I was pretty impressed. Uh, Twenty minutes into the game, I tweeted and also sent you a message that. Had Madge Ball gone by the wayside finally at Tiger Town, because that's the most creative I've seen the Tigers inside the attacking twenty in quite a while. The safe football was out. They're playing through their big boys up the middle for five tackles and then hoping something would happen on the last. It, it doesn't really mix with what Jackson Hastings is about. And even though I didn't think Luke Brooks was sensational yesterday and he wasn't that involved, he did come up with a couple of nice plays in that that opening half. You did. But they just had a bit more intent. The ball was zinging around. You, you've got to give yourself some self-belief in these games. And when Parramatta aren't playing as poorly as what their fans might think today, they go, oh, we've got people into the game. That's not how it happened. Tigers took their opportunities. The Tigers 
didn't waste when they had their chances in that first half. So they go to the half-time break up, up and you're just going, maybe, maybe they've got it in them. And as you say, they, they hung tough, found a way, and who knew? Uh, Luke Brooks at nine, maybe he's three positions in three weeks. Well, look, I think with Simkin being out, um, you know, you and I had a brief chat last night after the game. I, 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 I'm a bit of a believer that they might they might put Brooks in at nine, but then they've got to find a six that's better than him. And I'm not sure that young Madden is um, no, he's not. better than him, than, than Brooks. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> nine can be filled by, you know, you, you can have a real simple nine. You can get a nine that can just, you know, stand and deliver. Um, they're not going to create much around the middle as far as creativity goes, but you can get the job done um, as long as the person's got good hands, you know. Um, I, you know, when you, look at, when you look at that Tiger side just quickly um, – you know, there's still a few players out that are going to come back. Um, mm. That you know, like we've got Dewey and we've got uh, Tommy Talao, and you know, a couple of players that have played some first grade. So, and I and I do think they're a little soft in the centres. I'm not completely convinced with James Roberts and, and Luke Garner. Didn't yeah, he hasn't been terrible. I'll give like he he's playing better this year than he's played for a number of years. Oh his, yeah, his efforts there. He might he's, he might be in a good headspace, which is great for him. And yeah. and you know, um, but he's not getting any younger. And and you know, if 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 all the stars that have really aligned and they held on to someone like Moses Suli, who's who's you know has always been a handful there in the centres. I mean, they, they could have had have a, have a really good strike centre, which is probably what they wanted out of BJ Lalua, um, but it never really came to fruition. That's um, why they signed the off-season is now playing yourself off cup, Gildart. <laughs> that's right, yeah, Gildart. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I think I think with with the with the, the Poms that come over, mate, I think that, um, you know, a lot of them really struggle, especially the backs, you know, there's been a few forwards that have come through, but um, yeah, they they did have a quite a bit of uh, money value on the um, in the New South Wales Cup yesterday. Um, they had little, and the had... blokes did as well. I think the Dragons, like their, their their forward pack was pretty much all NRL players. <laughs> yeah, in the New South Wales Cup, the depth. Yeah, the Griffin's Biscuits loves his depth. Just finally, the Tigers. <laughs> uh, the next three rounds, I think they've got Souths, the Dragons, and Manly. So well, they should win one of those. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm. So two and two and seven is probably the best case scenario for the Tigers after it's, nine rounds. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Um, but you never know. There'd be no possibly no Tommy in that Manly game. Uh, so we'll see. And South aren't exactly the same side as we saw last year. Mm. Uh, so that's the Tigers. Well done. Great finish to the game. Uh, I'll re- reveal how I listened slash watched um, that game in the third segment of the show. But I wanted to speak about the rest of the competition. We're six rounds in. Uh, but ladder as it stands, Penrith 6-0, and looking tremendous. Uh, we'll get back to them in a second. But Melbourne are 5-1. Uh, and one. They're the top two sides, uh, and there's no doubt about that, really. Uh, Cronulla, Parramatta, the Roosters, and Manly are 4-2. and two. Uh, North Queensland, South Sydney, Warriors 3-3. Three and three. A whole bunch of teams on 2-4. and four. That's the Titans, Newcastle, Canberra, Dragons, Brisbane. And then the Tigers and Canterbury bring up the rear with one win from six starts. A couple of stats, just looking on the Rugby League Project page, um, I just wanted to, to bring out, and that's it's pretty significant. Six rounds in, the Tigers are averaging 10 points a game. And uh, six rounds in, the, top, the Bulldogs are averaging under 10 points a game. Is, mm. the, is, the, is the football... I mean, they, they played all right yesterday, but... Is it, is it a case of great defence with those sides, as in the teams that are playing them, or is it they're just not showing enough? And I'm, I'm going to throw Brisbane into the mix as well here. They're on, they've only got 77 points for as well. What's, is, it, is it early season, just can't get your attack together, or is it that safe football still around for those poor sides? Well, I think it's a, I think it's a bit of a combination, mate. I think what happens is, is when a team struggles, <clears throat> they tend to go in their shells a bit and not be flamboyant. Um, yeah. And, you know... Uh, quite often, the the you know, for want of a better term, the cellar dwellers of the competition um, have bring in new players, so that there's not as much gel, you know, they're not as well gelled going forward, and and they're they're struggling basically, so they're struggling to score points, um, and then yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a horrible kind of a um, uh, turn of events that happens, you know, when they when they're struggling and. Um, 
I feel sorry. I feel sorry for those teams, you know. I mean, but in saying that, I mean, I know we'll get to more teams later, but <clears throat> in moments, in moments, the, the Bulldogs don't look bad in, the, in moments. Not for, cr- right across the 80s, sometimes they look terrible. And it's the same as, same as the Broncos. The Broncos the other night, for the first 15, 20 minutes of that game against Penrith, looked good. You yeah. know, they didn't look like a team that was maybe struggling for points. And I, and I know that, uh, you know, um, Adam Reynolds is a big addition to their team and, and, he can, and he can make kind of any team look fairly stable um, with his leadership on the field. Um, but they, they don't – both those teams, both the Bulldogs and the Broncos and the Tigers, we saw it yesterday, don't need to make massive changes – to get on the on the right foot, you know. But in in a game of rugby league, there's always going to be a winner and a loser. And sometimes teams that aren't quite up to scratch will tend to do a lot more losing than winning. So you can't be surprised about it. Yeah, there's a bit of a trend for the pro old um, Bulldogs. Their last three games, they've conceded 44, 32, 36. Mm. And uh, depending on which commentator you listen to on the weekend, it was all the referee's fault or it was their own defence's fault um, in that game against Souths. Uh, we're going to lump in a few other sides that are going pretty ordinary. Uh, Newcastle lost four in a row. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Let me just double check that. Yes, they have. They beat the Roosters and the Tigers in the first two weeks. They've now lost to Penrith, Cronulla, Manly and St George. They're a team that I thought would really drop off after last year. I was feeling pretty stupid after two weeks. But <laughs> then thought it's still only two weeks. Uh, so the dogs uh, bark in the background. They didn't. They wanted to keep talking about the, the bulldogs. Um, but Newcastle, they've now got this this ponger show going off on the sidelines. Look, if I'm Newcastle, I reckon you can almost go. If he doesn't want to take the mass money at the um, Dolphins, I'm not sure who else is going to give him the same coin they can probably afford. So they can probably sit back and wait on him a little bit. Um, they look average. They don't have a halfback. Um, they've got a guy who kind of is okay in Clifford in the halves as well, but he's not your number one. Um, they're really built around that front row. And although they they sort of made a bit of a comeback on Sunday, they just do nothing for me in Newcastle. I, I really think their style of football is pretty average and um, it's going to be a long season for them. What's your thoughts on the night? Yeah, look, I, fairly similar to you. Um, I, I can't really see where they've grown from last year. Um, uh, you know, they haven't really improved at all. Um, the, the Ponga thing is a sideshow. Um, the thing with, the thing with Ponga is he's a, he's a really good player, you know, yep. and he, he probably deserves to be in that, that upper, you know, five to 10% of players getting paid. But the thing, the thing with him is if he's after money, I'm understanding that the Knights offered him 1.2 million a year to make him possibly the highest paid player in the game. Um, now, they, and they offered it, I think they offered a five-year deal or the, the, the remaining two plus another three um, yep. on an updated deal. Now, let's, let's think about his, his mindset for a moment, okay? Either, either he's happy or he's not happy at Newcastle living there, all right? He can't be unhappy with the money, right? Forget, take the money away for a moment. Is he unhappy with the football? Is he okay. Unhappy that does, Watson went to the Roosters? Does he does he want to live in Newcastle? Yes or no? Okay, that's a straight black or white. Is he unhappy with the team? That's a straight black or white. The money we know it's good. So, so if he's not happy with the football, going to the Dolphins isn't really going to help because they're going to struggle for the first couple of years. Nearly every team that's come into the competition, barring Melbourne and possibly Brisbane, have struggled. They'll struggle for three years, right? So if he goes there, they're going to struggle. They're going to lose games. Would he prefer to live in Brisbane? So I think they're the, they're the questions that have to be answered. Um, is, he, if he's, is he not really happy with the way O'Brien's coaching? Don't know. Uh, yep. No idea about that. So that's the, that's the Ponger equation. It can't be about money. They're offering him the top dollar. They can't, they can't in, a, in a 9 million or a 9.5 million salary cap, they can't offer a player any more than 1.2 million. It, it, it's suicide. The, the, yep. you're basically you're basically sacrificing the team for one bloke <clears throat> so that that's maximum capacity 1.2 million um and and that's all there is there ain't no more bickies in the tin so it can't be about money so they've offered him the maximum they've just got now they've just got to let him go if he doesn't want to be there see you later but that means it's going to free up a whole lot of money so it, it will uh, the challenge to them is obviously replenishing that roster i'm not sure what's coming through the system either up there in newcastle 
Mm. Um, let's go to the Dragons and Raiders. Our two sides. Uh, Canberra started the year off all right. They they beat the so-called superstars of the league, the Cronulla Sharks, in the first first round, mm. uh, which was upset. And they have uh, since then uh, capitulated against the Cowboys twice. Uh, somehow split, came back from 22 nil down to the Gold Coast Titans. And in between that, got pretty comprehensively beaten by Manly and Melbourne. What's your read on the Raiders? I know you weren't exactly glowing about uh, Ricardo on the phone last night, but you've had a night to sleep about it. What's, no, what's the feeling? No, mate, look, I, the Raiders are, are a team that, that have been, you know, unfortunately hit by, by um, you know, those two big injuries with, with your hooker and your halfback, uh, Hodgson and, yep. and Fogarty. Very unfortunate. Half your spine out before really you, you struck a blow. Um and um, that's hard, and, and and you can see the frustration with Ricky. He, you know, he's he's playing like Star, Starling is very good, um, yep. But Starling hasn't really done much this year, and and a lot of that is because you know their 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 halfback is is a rookie. Um, I don't think he's a very good rookie. Um, you know, he's he's, he's come from no, nowhere. No one had really ever heard of him, unless you're a real. Yeah. Uh, follower of junior football um, so you know they're struggling they're clunky um, again they're another team that look good in moments and and I remember uh, I, I, you know I've shot a couple of their games this year and and they haven't looked abominable but you know they the thing that was killing Ricky last year was only playing 40 minutes of footy the the, yep. the team was playing 40 minutes of football and, and they're, they're back at it they're doing that again. Um, and that's why he was frustrated the other night and actually hung them out to dry a little bit, the players. Well, that's the first time he's done it in a while and I enjoyed the fact that he had a crack at them because you can only defend the whole effort thing for so long when the same problems rear their head. Um, yep. I'm not going to go into a big diatribe, but the long and the short of it for me is I'm glad he had a go at them. Uh, let's see if he makes any changes because that's something that he has been uh, unwilling to do uh, I mean, the Matt Frawley starting at nine thing and then off the bench not playing. Just decisions like that. Let's not even start on all the rookies he's playing or not playing. But there's a lot that he needs to take into consideration from his own mind because I didn't really like his comment about Savage, about um, all these coaches think he's ready and I reckon he's not ready and then you picked him in your side. Mm. That was a moment of frustration. It was confusing. He'd, he'd want back. And um, I don't think he was having a direct crack at Savage. I think it was more trying to have a crack at the people who have been putting the pressure on him for not picking him. Um, I just thought it's the, probably the wrong place to have that first conversation because that would feed back to Savage. He'd know that his coach said that about him. He's 19 years old. And we talk about, you know, protecting these young players. And that's one that Ricky would definitely want to have back. Uh, Canberra, there's a long season to go. They're two and four. But the big issue for me is they just gave four points to a team they're competing for. Uh, one of those last two spots in the eights in the Cowboys. So... Um, I'm not looking very optimistically at them. Uh, speaking of optimism, uh, you were straight on the phone yesterday, uh, yesterday or the day before when the Dragons finally won another game. Uh, you're all like, oh, Elon Griffin, you love the bloke. How good is he? Give him another year in the in the coach's seat. Isn't that what you sent me message was? Uh, well, let's not chat about him, but the team the team played pretty good um, yeah. yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, sorry. Uh, yeah, they, look, they... they they definitely look better at the moment with with Bird at six, um, and um, you know they're, they're he, he's kind of like he's the way that I see him playing at the moment is a little bit like um, you know obviously not the same body size and stuff but he's a bit like Isaiah Yo he's playing like a link kind of position um, and uh, he's I don't think he's a pure five eighth. Um, but why isn't he playing lock if that's the role that? He can well, play I, I don't know. Well, you got Jack DeBellin, so I, I don't know. Oh, I don't he's know. a prop now. He's not a lock anymore. Yeah. Well, look, it's game's moved on from him. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe it has, and he needs to catch up. Maybe he's got, you know, he's got um, wants and desires to play to play uh, Origin football again. I'm not sure yeah. that's going to happen uh, because there's a couple of handy locks around um, at the moment in Isaiah Yo and, and Victor Radley and. Um, you know, a couple of others. But anyway, look, uh, the, again, with Saints, it's a little bit like the Tigers for me. I, I don't know whether that was just a, um, you know, a, a, an aberration. I don't know if it's going to be, a, it's going to keep happening. Um, 
for the rest of the season, that winning kind of mode. I, I you know, I'd like to see it, but I, I'm, I'm a little bit sceptical um, that there's a whole lot of ideas in the um, in the coaches' box as to how to keep winning against other teams. So we'll see. Um, good luck to them. I, I, I really hope they they uh, do as well as they can. They're a good enough side to, to flirt with that sort of 10 and 14, 12 and 12 sort of area. They've got enough players that are of NRL quality. Um, I, I don't understand the moving on from Sloan so early at fullback. Mm. Uh, the same really goes for Amone at 5'8". You train off season with him there and then um, a few rounds in, you, you throw him with a curve. And let's be fair, like um, the three games that um, they played with the Amone and... Um, What's his name? Uh, Sloan at full, uh, in the fullback job. Yep. It was the Warriors, which they won. Then they lost to Penrith in a game that they actually pushed Penrith. Yeah, they did. That was, that was their <laughs> they best really performance. They really pushed Penrith at Cogra. Yep. Then they lost to Cronulla. Mm. So, you know, two losses against two pretty decent footy sides. And then he changed things up against Parramatta and they got belted. Mm. Um, the next week they played South, who, as I've touched on already, I don't think are anywhere near the side they were last year. Mm. Um and they didn't disgrace themselves in that one. That's with the new combination. So then you get to the Newcastle game, and look, it's the Ben Hunt show. If he if he is given that freedom, um, he will win you games just like this one, just like this one, where he's got it over the halves in the opposition. He's going to be um, hunting around. Uh, his forward pack does a good enough job for him, and he's he's that kind of player. He will win games um, that are in the balance like that. So uh, if you if you're a Dragons fan. Um, as you, as you say, it's it's not the worst situation you've ever been in. What I don't understand is the Roxton building um, over there at the Dragons because I wasn't joking before. They had like four of the six front bar forwards in the New South Wales Cup team last year played mm-hmm. first grade with this year for the Dragons, I think it was. Yeah. Um, you just wonder what uh, the salary cap management in regards to that side is because you'd have to pay all those players okay coin to be playing um, first grade and New South Wales Cup. Mm. Um, back-to-back weeks. Um, Dragon's done. Let's look at the other sides in that lower section. Uh, we touched on Brisbane a bit. Look, this is the Adam Reynolds show. Um, if they give him decent field position and possession, he'll win them a few games, but they still are a pretty ordinary football side, all things considered. Uh, you wanted to touch on Stags quickly. Oh, I think I think Stags is a, um, is a, is a red-hot favourite to be the next center in line at the, you know for the origin team i i'd probably prefer stags at the moment over Crichton. um i think he's he's more aggressive i think he's um he's probably built a little bit more for for origin that's taken nothing away from Crichton, who's who's a player that i yep. really like as well um but if i had to pick a, a a team you know as i often say for my life um i'd probably go with stags over Crichton there who knows tommy could be back he's a bit of a fast well, healer Sometimes, so the fact that Mitchell's out as well actually suggests that the left the left centre spot might be open. Is there more of a chance of them playing um, Tommy back onto the left, yep. so he can play almost that sweeping left hand side position like he does at club level, mm. um, more so than playing him on the right where he's played the last couple of seasons and been our best player? Yeah, um, look, and then you put Stags or Crichton on the right. Yeah, I think I think that's the way it would go. Um, being that th- those those other two are both. Uh, pretty much right hand players. I know Crichton can play left and right, um, but yep. Stags is a is a right hand um, center. Um, he's a five eight two apparently. Um, but, but <laughs> yeah. Speaking of guys getting lots of money in the, the Broncos, uh, what would you pay Payne Haas if you had the chance to sign to your club? Oh well, um, well it depend obviously depends on the club and how stacked you are already. But if you really really need a strike forward, um, you got to be thinking you got to be thinking a million bucks, haven't you? I mean. Well, that's going to be the base, surely. Yeah, well, and um, and you know, it's a, it's a lovely number. It's a lovely number for them. But like I said before, uh, on a cap, where are we at the cap? Is it nine and a half? Nine? Something. It's under ten, right? And you got to, and you got to get twenty five players in. You got to get top twenty five. So your twenty five players have to fit into that nine point whatever it is million salary cap. When you've got one bloke on a million, and then you know one other. You know, generally teams have got two stars, you know, or two or three. Um, but if you go a million, let's look at Penrith for a moment, all right? Mm. Um, Nathan Cleary, 1.1. 1. 1. What's Luai on? And, and you know, we could turn this into, a, you could turn it into any team's conversation, but yeah, yeah. what's Luai on? Is he on 600? Okay, let's pretend he's on. I don't on think s- he's on an upgrade yet, but he surely, surely will be. All right. Um, 
and, and so the company's going to be asking for seven or eight, sure. Okay, so what's what's Yo worth to you? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> what's Fisher yeah, Harris worth he, to you? Yeah. Well, I've got a theory on this this million dollar thing. Yeah. Um, if you want to pay a guy a million bucks, he has to play nearly eighty every week. He just has to. So, if you're going to pay him that money for mine, you move half to the thirteen. Yeah. I just don't think you can play a pay a prop forward who plays 55, yeah. 60 minutes a game a million bucks. And well, I don't like what they're doing with Jason Tamalolo in North Queensland. That's what I was. It. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Tamalolo is is probably your study case, um, yep. and uh, he's a guy that got was it ten uh, nine million for ten years or something like that. Um, yeah, it was, it was ten for ten. I think. Okay, ten for ten. On the million, and it, and it started off on about eight hundred, so it goes up, mm. you know, on back ends. Um, and and what they're doing there, obviously, is hoping that the the salary cap increases and and revenue is good and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, look, to to get Payne Haas, and it, and it depends on the team too. You know, like let's let's pretend, let's say the Tigers want to get him. Well, the, the, unfortunately, the poor old Tigers have got to pay overs for anyone, um, as do probably the Knights, and as do a lot of the clubs that are in that bottom, you know, four to six teams. They've got to pay overs to get the player there. Um, so look, I don't know. What does does Payne Haas do, does does Benny want him at, at the Dolphins? Payne Haas's biggest paycheck is going to come from the Broncos. I'm pretty confident of saying that. I'm I'm um, I'm more than sure you're right. Um, but he's just I think if they want value out of a guy on that on that figure, um, you got to play him either on edge or you play him in the middle, and you want Payne Haas in the middle. I just don't don't see the value in playing paying a prop forward. Honestly, anything over seven, if I'm mm. honest with you, I just well, don't see how you get the value. Because of his age, because of his age, he does play a lot of minutes at the moment. Hmm. But but going forward, uh, you know, we're, he's probably not going to play those big minutes. You know, you're probably looking at sixty minutes, sixty sixty five minutes tops for a for a strike front front rower. I mean, at the moment, he's what is he twenty two years old or something? Um, well, my question to you then is, if you're paying a guy that amount of money, who gives a stuff about what the future holds? Just you need to win games now, don't you? Yeah, well, that's one way to look at it, but but he's not going to want to leave the Broncos on anything less than, you know, probably three a three year would be his minimum contract that he'd probably want. So you'd probably be pretty safe paying him a million bucks for three years at a club. Does he does he join um, the feeder of the Gold Coast? That is the question. We should enough, talk about the Gold Coast Titans. Is there enough money at the Gold Coast? Is it, well, like, I think he's the only one getting big money, and Proctor will come off the books. I think Proctor will actually was on a lower deal anyway. What uh, about the captain? Quite quickly, a two and four. Sorry. What about the captain? He's on big coin, isn't he's he? The captain. For Sua Moali. Yeah, he's on big coin. He wouldn't be on a million bucks because they signed him before he before he absolutely hit superstardom at Melbourne. Because mm. the whole argument Melbourne had was he hadn't done anything beyond be a bench player there, mm. and the Titans went out and paid him heaps of money. And, I mean, that's the same thing that happened with Hearts at Brisbane. That they signed him to a five hundred thousand dollar a year deal after two first grade games. Yeah. Um, and they didn't want to repeat that mistake with Reese Walsh. That's, they, that's the reason that Reese, Reese Walsh. I can't say that name properly. Um, <laughs> the reason that he left to go to the Warriors was he basically said, "I want all this money," and they said, "You haven't played first grade." And they'd seen what happened with Hearts. Yeah. Now that had worked out, but it could have blown up in their face. Yeah. Um, the Titans, mate. They're two and four. Uh, oh. They feel like they're played better footy than this, but the truth is they lost that game of the Raiders when they led 22-0. Yeah, I shot and that game. they've also lost two games to Parramatta that have been, you know, up there to be won yeah. um, in that, both those matches. So they're two and four. Uh, AJ Brimson at 5'8", is it doing anything for you? No, I think he's a better fullback. Agreed. I think he's a better fullback. <laughs> I think he can play 5'8", then. I mean, it's great yeah. to know that he can, but uh, I think he's, his position is fullback. So they've had no Jaden Campbell for three weeks, and he's played six, and he hasn't been there. I, I, hmm. I just think you'd weaken in your side. Yeah. Um, Will Smith can do a job. He did the job there on the weekend when they made the come against Man, come back against Manly. Um, I, I don't know. Holbrook's a funny one. Just when I think he's got a team that he can really open the, um, the floodgates and let his team play football, he. he Goes back to the safe and he picks his Jared Walters on the bench and rolls mm. through the middle one. Um, but then they put the foot down against Manly the other night and you're just going, okay, there's a footy team here. They're a side that I just wish he'd flick the switch. I really wish he'd just say, play all that attack, offload at will, and just see what comes of it. 
Mm. I don't think they're a good enough defensive side to play the other side of the football. That's my personal view. Yeah. Maybe he's hoping to develop them into a de- defensive team. Well, you he know. does come from the Roosters system, doesn't he? Yeah. Football. Well... Wasn't the assistant coach, Sir Robinson? Yeah. And, and, plus, and plus, you know, the stats say, and you, I know you love a good stat, the stats say that you ain't winning a competition without being a good defensive team. Because right now the uh, Titans are the worst uh, in the bottom five of defence. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, anyway. Um, Titans, don't worry about it if you're a Titans fan. Not that there's that many of you out there. Um, but they, um, they're, they're in striking distance. A couple other teams we need to get to. Uh, Cowboys and Warriors, I put them very much in the same category of they've got some players. They've got some really good players. Um, but I just don't see... I don't see the consistency over 25 odd rounds. It's going to say, yeah, lock them into your top eight. I just, they're both teams that I just think have got soft underbellies and aren't, aren't impressive enough to say, yeah, finals time. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, I haven't seen too many of their games this year, to be honest with you. Um, there's, there's obviously the way the TV works, you know, um, there's, and the way that I work with, with my work. Um, I, yeah. I, I don't get to do, you know, their, their home games because they're in North Queensland and we only see them every second week uh, and sometimes in Sydney and sometimes elsewhere. But um, one question for you, mate, is what did you think of uh, Montoya's um, grade one name calling, four weeks for grade one name calling? Right, they've, they've made a decision, that's what it is. Um, they will have to enforce it from here on in. That's the, with anything, mm. you know, if it happens once, you're going to have to um, keep those audio mics open and uh, come down on anybody else. Uh, yeah, how, how long... Are unlucky that they happen to be in a stoppage. That's the question. When I say unlucky, I'm not yeah. defending what he said. I'm just saying he's in that situation. I mean, I thought it was somebody else when he looked at the vision. So did I. And it turned out to be Montoya. Yeah. So, look, he's, he's copping four weeks. Uh, we'll get to the match review. That'll be the second segment mm. and how inept they're going in this season. But, um, look, yeah, it's what it is. And uh, I think you're about to bring up a pertinent point. Well, well, my my issue with it is is this, okay? And, and I look, you can't have people, you can't you can't have people, even on the street, running up and down the street, calling people, um, you know, from the gay community That's derogatory right. names, yeah. right? We we can't have that. The fact of the matter is, Montoya Montoya knows felt and knows that he's not gay, right? Yep. And the word that he used wasn't actually derogatory to felt it's just a terminology it's not you know my issue with it is this okay what would what happens we we, we get so weirded out about offending minority groups what happens if what happens if next week big big horsborough from from raiders is laying on the ground and someone calls him a big red-headed wanker like it, that's derogatory, okay, and it's and it's isolating a certain group of the population. Are we yep. going to give him four weeks for that? You know the answer. Well, I know we're not. I, I, I know we're not, and 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 I just it just weirds me out that we get so um, protective of of a certain group of people whether that be but whether whether it be the the you know gay people or whether it be blonde headed people or whether it be people from another country we we tend to lose sight of perspective and and that's that's really all i want to say on it I, and i think the four weeks mm. was in my mind in my opinion is absolute overreach he should have been sat down for a week and probably a, a, a fine you know probably a five thousand dollar fine or something like that um and maybe asked to attend, uh, you know, something to do with with you know that minority group. Um, so you know, I, I'm 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 fearful that the next move is um, that someone does it again, and then they get more than four weeks, or you know, even worse. And it'd be interesting, but it I, I could see it going down a very very deep rabbit hole. Would be when. Someone, some bright spark from TV land decides to mic up players, every player, every week, for every game. 
and then yeah, analyse what they and then analyse what they say. It's been that's been and that's been done before. Well, it's been done on, on I don't care what what as you say. It's it's in regards to whoever is being um, deliberately or undeliberate. What's the word for deliberately targeted with these words? But hmm. what's to stop someone going through games of the past? Well, there's 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 nothing, there's nothing to stop them. The mics are really good, and you can hear a lot um, with directional mics, but. You know, watch this space. In the next five years, players mic'd up, all of them. Watch. Yeah. You know, and then the... the and, and, I, and I think Phil Gould's got a really good point when he says that he, he doesn't like mics on the field at all because he thinks that, you know, the general public don't deserve to know. And I, I tend to agree. You don't deserve to know. It's, not, it's none of your business what they're talking about. And it, and it shouldn't be any of our business at home in the living room what they're talking about. And I think that when let's talk about something that both the coaches have referred to, and it's uh, it's not directly on the field related, but it's in regards to perspective and perception. Uh, both Nathan Brown and Todd Payton from the two teams we're discussing at the moment have referenced uh, the top end of town getting favourable calls from referees, uh, and if you've been winning for a couple of years, you seem to get all the favourable calls. What's mm. your view on that? Oh, uh, I think I think in their position it'd be hard to see it any other way, um, you know. And 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 I think human nature um, is a really hard thing to fight. And and I'm not saying the referees are doing that. Um, and I, if, if they're doing it, I don't think they're doing it actively. But you know, if, if you if you see, for example, if you see um, you know a, a really really talented footballer versus maybe one that's not so talented you'll have a preconceived idea as to what's going to happen. Mm. And, and I think when, you, when there's a, a lower team playing against a, probably a more polished team, you'll probably tend to think that the, the, the team that isn't as um, successful may be a little bit dirtier, a bit lazier, a bit... You know, you know what I mean? Like in their approach to football, um, they might lay on players a bit longer and the, and the clean-cut team, the high flyers, may not do those certain things and we all and we know they all not so much a clean cut clear cut team as the ones who are better at it than you are well that's what and i mean the ones who are more successful at the standard let's be let's be frank we're talking about penrith and melbourne their greatest assets and and i remember identifying this last year that i thought yes melbourne are the kings that slow on the play the ball down and getting hands in and, and reaching around and, and doing everything they can to peel off slowly but nobody held on to the ball better in the tackle than penrith they were outstanding at getting someone in there and, and locking in and making it very hard to have a quick play the ball. What is great about their tactics in that regard is that they do it every single tackle. And when you do it every single tackle, it means that the outliers don't emerge. You don't see the it longer just looks versions. Normal. It just looks normal. It looks normal. Mm. The problem that your Cowboys and your Warriors and whichever other team you want to put in, when they start trying that tactic, they have to physically slightly it's not it's not the muscle memory element involved so they actually are laying on a little bit longer as you look at it you go gee he's really on there for a long time because you're comparing it to generally how they tackle now i'm sure there are stats on play the ball speed and they're going to turn around and say no no oh, this is this is all incorrect but by the beholder stuff you watch melbourne and penrith defend and you see the ball get slowed down you see the other teams try it and Lo and behold, the referees do the same things we do, and they go, gee, he's on there for a while. We better pin him for that. Mm. The issue that these coaches probably should be more bringing up, as far as I'm concerned, it's those, it's those little minor ones that get called on them that I'd be blowing up to, if it mattered, to Bannersley. Yeah. And that I'd be bringing up... There was one I saw in the Penrith uh, Broncos game the other night. I think it was Kurt Capewell. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's off-centre at marker by half a centimetre. It is... Im- yeah, like yeah. It's nothing. Yeah. It's Im- and he got pinged and, he's, uh, and, and let yeah. Penrith get on the, on the front foot. And I'm looking at it going, if that is a penalty, then every single field goal attempt in the history of mankind should have been a sin bin. <laughs> the guy running off the mark. Yeah. It, and it was Jerry Sutton, my favourite referee. And I'm just going, you can't penalise that. And they're the ones that if I'm a... If I'm, the, if I'm the Kevin Walters in that regard or if I'm the Paytons or your Browns, they're the ones I'm sending and putting on like high rotation and sending in like a 30-minute video of just that single one time and time again and going, explain to me how that is a penalty yet and then show like one set of six in defence from Melbourne or Penrith. Mm. You know, that, that's what I'd be doing. But, yeah. you know, anyway, 
Uh, Cowboys and Warriors um, feels like also ran territory, but we'll see. Um, South Sydney, mate, they're a strange side because they've got still got some pretty handy players, but they have been um, very disappointing for mine in 2022. Yeah, I don't think they've lived up to to the hype. I think that I think that they've gone backwards a little bit when Reynolds disappeared. Um, up north, uh, I, I, you know, I think that Ilias is going to be a pretty good player, um, but he's certainly not. He's warming into it. He's no Adam Reynolds though, not at this stage no. of his career, uh, and no one expected that. Everyone, I think, what they expected was for Cody Walker and and Co to um, to pick up a little bit of the slack. I'm not sure that's happened. Um, no, Cody Walker isn't that organising half, um, as has been well documented by every media source known to man. Um, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think they're going to be a grand finalist this year. From what I've seen so far, I don't think they've got another. I don't think they've got two extra gears to click into. Um, they're still a, they're still a pretty formidable outfit though when they're at strength with Latrell playing and and whatnot. And and I'll tell you what that Taff that Taff isn't a bad player. Um, he's a good footy player. He's a good footy player, and and you know. I suspect that going forward, if he if Latrell's going to insist, or if they're going to insist on keeping Latrell at fullback, Taff will probably become a free agent pretty soon, um, mm. and I reckon he'd get pretty good coin um, as a fullback at another club. Although, yes, although we so do, far. although we do, we we did have a discussion yesterday about short fullbacks, um, you know, and uh, they can come, they they can't, they've got certain elements about them that. Um, you know, and we're talking about Dane Laurie mostly here. Yep. Um, it's it's a tough ask to to get someone who's you know five ten, five eleven to be jumping against the likes of Tommy Trebojevic and and guys Biden. that are you know those kind of fellas six yeah. foot three, six foot four. Uh, yeah, but anyway, yep. um, but I think I think I think uh, Souths are oh, top. They're they're they're, they're going to make the top eight. We know that. Yeah, they'll make the top eight. Now, this is their season so far, just to give some perspective. They lost to Brisbane in that monumental top set in round one. Then they got beaten by Melbourne by a point. They turned around and beat the Roosters, lost to Penrith, and then they've beaten up on St. George, Illawarra, and Canterbury in back-to-back weeks. That just seems about right for them. Yeah. They'll, they'll steal the, the game against the other top six sides here and there. Yeah. They'll probably get beaten by the top couple of teams every time they play them, and they should take care of business against most of the other sides. Mm. Um, some signs that left side was waking up against Canterbury, I will say that. Um, the other day. Now it leaves us with the top uh, six sides. Um, Manly won four straight and they don't have had Tommy for the last couple of weeks. Mm. They're a match-up side. They'll lose against the top sides. They'll beat everybody else. Um, that's pretty much what Manly was last year and I'm pretty confident that'll be them again this season. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Um, they'll, they'll be in the eight, mate. Um, they'll be knocking on the door of the four. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I think it just depends uh, on. Yep. I think it just depends on injuries above them, um, you know, mm. rather than what they're, you know, what they can do. They need they need Tommy, but they've played pretty good in the last couple of weeks without Tommy. So. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Roosters, they were my preseason pick. Um, I haven't seen enough from them yet to be very confident that's going to come to pass. I said to you last night, I. I been a little bit surprised that Kerry's playing as much of a backseat role as he has been. Mm. Them figuring out how him and Walker coexist running that side. I think that the key thing for me will be them playing on both sides of the field. It's one of the things that um, Walker was particularly good at the back end of last year. He'd just jump on either side whenever he needed to. Uh, that'll unlock Teddy, I think, a bit more. And obviously Manu, who went from being an all-world player a week before to going completely missing against the Warriors. They've got a good enough unit, but at this stage, I think they're a fair bit off the pace of the top sides. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they've still got some improving to do. But, you know, <clears throat> a lot of these, you know, Penrith, Penrith and, and Melbourne have been standouts for the last couple of years. Um, and I think, you know, they're very, very consistent teams. They're very, very workmanlike. And other teams take a little bit to, to get into the groove and find certain things and I think that's what we're seeing with the teams below Melbourne and, and Penrith um, you know I think they're just taking it pretty they're just cruising you know I mean yep. the Roosters had a pretty upset year last year they had a lot of injuries and you know 
the players that were out for the whole season and, and whatnot. And, you know, they're just uh, gently, gently new halves pairing, really, in Kiri and, and um, Walker. So I think... I think I think they'll be there when the whips are cracking, unless they have another injury crisis. Um, but we're not seeing the best of them yet. They've got a very soft, in the middle of a, like a really soft stretch of, of opposition. They've just beaten the Cowboys, Brisbane, and the Warriors in a row. Then they play the Dragons, Bulldogs, and Gold Coast. Um, <laughs> this is the these are the six weeks that I'm sure Trent Robinson looked at and went, "We've got to win all six of those uh, if we want to play top four, uh, which even though I've been unimpressed to a degree from them this season, they should end up in. Uh, now the top four is Penrith, Melbourne, Cronulla, Parramatta. Parra, as we mentioned, played pretty well yesterday and got beat. Um, is there a weakness that you look at after a couple of years of, of the way that Arthur's been moulding this side? Is there a weakness there that you can identify or is it just they're, they're really good but they're just not great? Um, look, I, I, I think I th- I'm just not sure they've got I, I just don't think they've got the team the players, the individuals to win a competition in, you know, I, I think they've got some really, really good players you know, and I think they've got players in that team who you'd probably pick in a you know, in a best of NRL team, if you had to pick you know, a squad of of seventeen players. There's a couple of players in their their team that you'd pick. You'd have in your in your seventeen squad. I I just don't know if they've got the. I just I, I'm not I'm not sure what it is. I I really have to sit down and, and analy- analyze what they're doing because I haven't done that with them, and I don't mm. really understand their game as well as I do other teams. But um, no, I, I I'm not sure that they've got the the bickies to go and, and fight against the, when, when the roosters are really cracking and when Penrith and when Melbourne are really going, and even when Manly um, are going, I'm not sure, I'm not sure Parramatta can go with them. I have major question marks about their three quarter line. And I know people are going to say other injuries, see those out, but this was their round one, three quarter line. Sean Russell, Will Penasini, Wanga Blake and Bailey Simmonson. It doesn't stack up against the top sides. No. It just doesn't. No. And I like Panasini. Um, I think he's got some ability, but he's also 19. Um, Brown, Moses playing great football. McGuffinson having his moments. Uh, that four pack is is just really, really good at regular season level. They roll through other teams. He plays big minutes on his forwards. Marty is a great player. I can't believe they didn't find the bickies to hold on to him. Um, but I just go, if you want to beat Para. Starve him in possession in your own 20 if you can, because that's where Gutherson turns on. Um, but they're not going to hurt you in the outside backs. They're just not. Mm. And that's the bit that I go, I, I compare theirs to Penrith, I compare theirs to Melbourne. Um, yeah, Paro. Yeah, um, as, as most of the time I'm going, yeah, you'll beat everybody. But when it comes to the really important games, I don't think you've got the, the soldiers to... Beat the top sides. Yeah, that's that's just how I feel at the moment, and, I, and and they've done nothing to really prove me otherwise. Um, you know, and and it's not because of yesterday's performance against the Tigers. So I think the Tigers just were up. Um, you know, and sometimes when you get an NRL team that's just, you know, like that, and and at that moment, then they're they're almost impossible to beat. But yeah, Parramatta, I, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's the coaching. Again, it's a team I haven't really analysed all that much, mate, because I'm not really you know, all that you know, worried about them. Um, I'm not really... If you're, if you're a Parra fan going, we beat Melbourne, but you, you lost to Cronulla in the last minute by conceding a try and you lost to the Tigers by conceding a 40-minute field goal. Mm. You'll win yeah. those games. You want, us, you want us to stop having doubts? Win those games. Yeah. They, they, there's a, they should be 6-0, and realistically. Apparently. Yeah. They should, have beaten, they should have beaten Cronulla and they should have beaten the Tigers. Yeah, and, but, they, and they could be. They, they've, got, they've got the talent. They've got the, you know, but... My, my my thing with Para is is they've definitely they've got the talent, you know, in regular season to finish number one. They mm. they really do. But I wonder I wonder about them because they're a little bit unproven. I wonder if they've got another gear for finals. I wonder if they've got you know that that extra depth that they can dig into. I'm not sure. Um, Cronulla, uh, another team that you could argue when they got beaten pretty. 
well in the second half the other night, mm. probably their second loss of the season to Melbourne. But they got beaten in the last couple of minutes against Canberra in round one. But in between that, they beat Parramatta, Dragons, Newcastle, Tigers, and everyone's claiming that Fitzgibbon's one of the greatest coaches of all time. Look at this team. They've got a really interesting stretch coming up. Uh, the Sharkies, let me just bring it up while I think about it. They've got Manly, Brisbane, and the Warriors. If they win all three, do I have to admit that they're a top four side? Yep. Yeah, you do. If if they win all three, then what are they sitting on at the moment? They're, are they two? Uh, they're in third spot. They're four and two. Four and two. Yeah. Well, you know, the next three games takes us to nine games. And then we've got the magic round. I think if 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 you can if you can have only dropped two games in nine or ten, um, yep. I think you're a genuine contender. I think they are a genuine contender. My my issue with with the Sharks, and I do think Fitzgibbon's doing a great job. By the way, I'm not saying he's the best yep. coach in the world um, at this stage. <laughs> I'm being a bit facetious with that comment. He's a new got, coach, but I, I, I think he is a very, very good coach. And I think he does know how to communicate effectively with the team, which is half the battle, I think, with football players. Um, and they trust him as well. And they're, 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 you can see that they're playing for him. And that's they're all the... Yep. They're all the I guess uh, all the KPIs that you want to hit as an NRL coach especially early on in your career. Um, my, is Nico Hines a halfback? Yeah, he is. He's a halfback, is he? You reckon he's a reckon seven? He okay. Yeah. In so, that team, he's a seven. Right. Did you reckon they bought him for that? Do you reckon they got him? I reckon they bought him to play fullback and then Will Kennedy had six weeks of great football at the end of last year and they went, oh, we've got a fullback already here. Yeah. We might have to put him to seven. What, what happened to... Um, what happened to Trindle? Did you, did, I know uh, Trindle was was he suspended for the first round or something? Yeah, he got done in the, the trial game for a, I think it was a lifting tackle possibly or a unlucky tackle or back back when those when those things got actually punished. Um, yeah. Hasn't that disappeared? We'll get to that in a sec. Unlucky um, though, hey, because I mean I think he <laughs> don't do it in the preseason. <laughs> well, I mean it, it opened the door for Nico, and I think and I think Cronulla have been fairly happy. Opened with... the door for Matt Moylan. That's what it opened That's, the door yeah, for. Because exactly. Moylan's Moylan got a chance to play, and yeah. he's done he's done everything asked of him. I think he's been pretty good. Look, I actually like the group they've got together at the Sharks. They've got speed. I don't know if they've got the guys up front. I still have my question marks there. But if you want to underline the, the things that give you an indication that Fitzgibbon's had a bit of an impact on them. I know this whole Bondi wall thing was talked about, but they've considered, in, the, the, in their four wins, they considered 16 points, 12 points, zero points, and four points. Mm. Good signs. Yeah. Good signs. And they can attack. Um, it's a nice mix. I'm still not declaring them top four because, as I said, you've got Parramatta just below them, the Roosters just below them, and Manly just below them. And over those next three games... Those three teams, Parramatta have got Newcastle, Cowboys, Penrith. Roosters have got Dragons, Bulldogs, Titans, and Manly have got Cronulla, um, South and Tigers. So uh, even if they are going well after that you know, ninth round here into Magic, there's no guarantee. I think there's those, those five teams or six teams are still going to be fighting pretty heavily for that top four spot. I don't think mm. there's anything um, going to be decided by halfway through the year in regards to that. Um, let's go on to the top two sides and wrap up this very opening, long opening statement. You guys knew it was going to be that when you, you, you tuned in. We haven't spoken all year, so we were going to go through every side. Melbourne, and we touched on this last night in prep for the day, Melbourne looked unstoppable last year. Yeah. And before we, we declare that Penrith threw a better side than they were last year, let's reflect on the fact that for 16 weeks, there wasn't a better team rugby league than the Melbourne Storm. Then, I don't know if they... I can't remember. They lost to somebody late in the season and they stopped scoring points. And then before we knew it, they couldn't lift a finger against Penrith in that prelim final. I don't look at Melbourne this year and go, they're a better side. They are playing with a bench that you don't know. Um, but they've also got Harry Grant, healthy. Munster's playing well. Hughes is playing well. Pappenhausen's breaking all kind of, kind of scoring records for the first couple of rounds of the season. What is it about Melbourne that makes you think they're not as good as Penrith? Is my question to you. Jeez, that, that, well, that's a good question. Um, because they're five and one, they're not they're not struggling. And the game they lost was to Parramatta, who found a way to win that game when you thought Melbourne had it. Mm, mm. I, mate, I don't know. 
I'm not. I'm not sure they are. I'm not sure that that Penrith are a better team. Um, mm. You know, it, it, we'll we'll find out at Magic Round. Game one of Magic Round um, is when they play. Um, yep. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I I couldn't with a straight face. I couldn't say that Penrith are a better team than Melbourne um, until they play each other and probably play each other two or three times this year. We're not going to know. Um, so yeah, I, I'll I'll have to I'll have to. Um, regretfully not engage in that that banter <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> because i don't That's think it's right. i don't think it's very safe uh to do it uh because melbourne you know they're freaks mate they they they're a little bit like melbourne have got a little bit of of, of queensland about them for you know for pretty good reason uh for many years they basically made up a lot of the the team that was in the, <laughs> in the queensland team but they they tend to be able to uh, do what Queensland could do and, and pull a win out of their backsides um, yep. when you least expect it as far as coming from a position. You know, like they could be they could be 16-2 down at half time and come out and win a game 32-16. Um, they're, they're, they're like that. They can, you know, they can go blow for blow with you and then, you know, somehow miraculously pull out the right play at the right moment and win a game by one point. And they can win a game by by forty one points, um, and it doesn't really seem to matter who they're playing. Um, so I, I find them a, a fairly formidable force in rugby league, yep. and, and a lot of it has to do with obviously their recruitment and the people they have there, in in obviously Craig Bellamy and and Frank Panisi and and the rest of the crew that are are there. So. Yeah, I, I can't say that, mate. I can say that they're level pegging at the moment, and just because Penrith have one more win on the board, yes, statistically they're a better team at the moment. But um, let's get through let's get through the first ten or twelve rounds before we really start to uh, beat on our chests. I reckon. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so the next three weeks, Melbourne have got the Warriors, Knights, and Dragons, and they, so they should win all of those. And, they'll be eight and one entering that game against the Panthers. Yeah. Panthers have got the Raiders, Titans, and Eels. So there's a chance they could drop that game to the Eels. They should beat the other two. They should. Um, yeah, they should. And, and it, both teams being nine, uh, eight and one entering Magic Round. In the, the that could game. happen. Yep, yep. And and mate, um, I, I often you know from from my own experiences, you know, um, <laughs> I often think losing a game or two is not that bad. I, I you know I think it keeps. I think. Sometimes when they win a lot of games in a row, yes, it gives them great confidence, but does it give them too much confidence and an air of invincibility um, and then have their pants pulled down? Um, so you don't have to scrap as much. You, you can, if you get to, like, that's what happened with Melbourne last year. They, they were a victim of how good they were yeah. because they blew teams away week after week after week and yeah. got to games at the point end of the season that weren't open affairs and they had to try and find a way to score three tries, and all of a sudden it was like, well, it's not just being given to us. Yeah. And we can't just force our will on it. We've got to find other ways. And yeah. that's what happened in the prelim final last year against Penrith. That's right. Um, Penrith, nothing nothing to be um, critical of them. They they survived life without Nathan Cleary for a few weeks and did it easily. Yep. Came back, and he's been outstanding. Uh, we will get to his tackle in the next segment uh, briefly. But, uh, yeah, look. What really impresses me about both Melbourne and Penrith so far in 2022 is last weekend. This was the Melbourne Storm bench. Okay. Tyron Wishart, Tepai Maroa, Chris Lewis, Alec McDonald. The um, Penrith bench last round was Mitch Kenny, Scott Sorensen, Spencer Lino, and Jamin Salmon. You are not putting that as benches into the top five of any club across the NRL. And that's not a criticism of the players. It's just where they are standing-wise and money-wise. These are clubs that work out, can a guy play a role for me? Can he work into the rotation system I've got going? If he can, great, we'll put him in. Both those benches don't blow you away. Yet no. they've got one loss across um, 12 games so far this year. Mm. Um, just some food for thought when it comes to roster building. And we touched on the old uh, Dragons with all their depth, you know. Yeah, no, you look at some of those guys playing reserve grade for the Dragons and you compare them against the bench guys for the, like, these these two great sides on the weekend and you'd say, oh, those players are far better than the ones that played in South Wales Cup for the Dragons. Mm. The way the game's going, you just got to find value and you got to learn to have um, guys that can just fill in and play a role for you uh, rather than 
earn you big money because of what they've done in the past. It's an interesting way that they've built their rosters. That is the state of the NRL after six rounds. We'll be after the break. We're not the footy show to quickly talk about two things. The match review committee and uh, commentators. We'll have a good commentator here on Not The Footy Show. Not The Footy Show. Show? I thought you had some big news, mate. Where's your big news? Where is it? Okay, we're back. It's Not The Footy Show episode 250. You've had about an hour of absolute waffle, just the way you like it, um, with some chopped chips thrown in. Uh, Cocksmith, the match review committee, or the judiciary as I like to call them, they got a change forced on them just before the season started. And when I say just before the season started, I mean like the day before the season started. And effectively, the players got a win. And that was grade one offences would pretty much be fines. So they wouldn't actually face any time off if they got charged with a grade one. And there would be no loading. Um, so basically, all your records were wiped clean. When you first saw the wipe clean factor, what was your first thought? WTF. That was my first thought. What? What? Hold on. So a bloke that's got a, a, a history as long as his arm is now yep. as good as a rookie. Correct. As far or as someone who has been playing ten years and hasn't done a thing wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I that's look the at, bit that that's the bit that struck me. How did that happen? The ones that haven't made a mistake. Did, uh, because of player power. Okay. In, in what Apparently way? The, the players' association went to him and said it's not fair that they, they can miss grand finals because of past indiscretions or miss origins because of past indiscretions. Everything should be judgment's merits. And then they somehow managed to get the uh, NRL to agree to not suspending players. And I'm sure coaches are sitting in the background rubbing their hands going, fantastic. Um, but apparently you you can basically take someone's head off, but if it's a grade one because you've got no loading, then you just get fined. This last weekend, everything I think that was charged, let me just double check that, was a fine. And you look, think of some, some of the tackles and things that happened um, this weekend. <laughs> mm. And, uh, you know, a month ago they were getting sent off or getting sin bin um, or getting weeks out. Yeah, every single every single charge this weekend um, was a fine. Mm. So way to, way to teach players not to do it, you know. And the one that comes to mind, there was a few this weekend, but one comes to mind, Nathan Cleary tackle um, on uh, Billy Walters. Um there's no defending it. It's, it's not good. It's it's a wrestle move. He's clearly learnt that as a as a way of training in the off season. Um, the long and the short of it, Cocksmith, is if Billy Walters does his ACL, uh, how many weeks is Nathan Cleary sitting down for? Mate, I think we're going to see quite differently here. I don't think, I don't think there's any intention in that whatsoever. There's no intention to to. You know, I, I think Nathan had just as much chance of hurting himself in that tackle as hurting Billy that's Walters. Not, that's not the issue here. That's it. And this is this is my frustration with it. I don't think he's trying to hurt Billy Walters. I agree with you, hundred percent. He's not trying to hurt him. Is he trying to enact a move that's that makes Billy Walters prone on the ground and doesn't get up quicker? Which is oh, what he's he, learned. What he wants to get him on the ground, but that's as old as old as you know. That, but that move, that move, not not a classic rugby league tackle. No way, no way, no. No, but I mean, we... we... But he's responsible for that. That's my point. He's responsible for what he's done. Well, is he responsible or is the guy that taught him how to do it responsible? Coach. He's no, I'm just saying, I mean, we, we can we can take no, He's it. responsible because he still chooses to do it. And it's, it's the point I'll make with Felice Capusi and that's on the sofa, Solomona and Jared Rear Hargraves, whoever. This is my issue is that, and it's why I brought up the whole loadings off the table. If a Jared Rear Hargraves does it or a Nelson, well, Nelson seems to skate somehow with a judiciary channel. We'll use Hargraves as an example. If Hargraves does that tackle, he's got two to four weeks off straight away. Straight away. Why? He doesn't have any loading. No, no. Because of his reputation. Well, not There's anymore. There's just no doubt, no doubt about it whatsoever. Not anymore. Because he, he did doesn't. something the other day, which was pretty average. When he was getting up to play the ball and he pinned the guy's leg. Mm. Didn't get charged. Um, I just... The thing with the Cleary one is that if, if he'd done something serious, he gets suspended. I well, just... he probably would, and, and we've seen that happen before, where and, and it's and it's quite an well, it's it's a it's a newish phenomenon that mate that that mm. you know a bloke gets injured and players know it now and they, they we see it on every crusher tackle at least once or twice every game, a player will hold his neck, the referee yep. will hear something in his little earpiece and he blows his whistle. Now, there was. You know, the the whole crusher thing has is 
is such a grey area for me because I reckon that 99.9% of the time, players would not knowingly and willingly crush someone's neck on purpose because they know what it feels like when you've backed into a tackle and a player, you know, you get a little bit lower than the, the defender and the defender's body weight ends up on your neck. It's, it's rarely intentional, you know. It's super rare, I believe, that it's an intentional move to, to maim another player. Um, but every game we see players holding their neck, they get up and they you know, shake their head around and they oh, rub their neck and then next thing the whistle gets blown. So what I'm, what, I guess what I'm saying is, is I, I don't think... I know we've got, to ta- we've got to look at it like two things, okay? If, if, was there intent in the tackle? No, okay. Yeah. But but did did something recklessly happen or carelessly happen mm. because of the method used? And then, quite often, if the if the player was genuinely injured, and and thankfully Billy Walters wasn't in that situation, but if he was injured and or if he gets concussed, even then, you know, if he's got to leave the field, I mean, something might happen. If he if he because he whacked his head on the ground, but if he if he does do his ACL, yeah. then yeah, Nathan Nathan would probably end up getting four weeks for that. And I guess the and I'll bring it up as a few things. But there thankfully, was a he did bad crusher, bad exactly right, bad crusher from Kafusi that somehow didn't get sin bin Yeah, there. that was that was terrible. Yeah. Um, but I, my theory with crushers is I think those, as you say, they're not intentional. Most, but of them. I think if there's going to be a punishment then that should be sell, it should be handled within the game. I have no, no issues with a player getting binned for a crusher and that be the, the long and the short of the, the challenge because generally the player that gets done a crusher has to go off for the HIA anyway. Yeah. I, I, I don't think those ones necessarily should get suspended because I don't think there's that... Well, if it's a bad one, I think they should get suspended, but the ones that generally happen, I, I prefer the punishment to happen in the game um, yeah. because the team that has the player done to it, they lose the player. Um. The Cleary one is the reckless category. It's not careless because he's choosing to do that particular tackle. Um, whereas sometimes you'll see a head high tackle that is careless because a guy will fall or, you know, the big Victor Radley situation yesterday yeah. um, where he's trying to get out of the end goal. He tries to stop him. I wouldn't say that. He's not, he's not reckless in that, that instance. He didn't even get charged. Mm. But the one I have to bring up is the Sofa Solomona incident from a couple of weeks ago against Makatawa where he came in with a cocked wrist and smashed him in the side of the head. Yeah. And Sofa Solomona got a fine. He didn't he got I think he only got suspended, he got penalized, didn't get sin binned. Um, and that was a great example of where the loading didn't kick in and, and hurt him because the judiciary said, Oh, grade one. Look, there was intent in that. He knew what he was doing. He was swinging arm. And he skated. Yeah. Um we've got a real problem where the head high sin bins have gone again. It did, we didn't even get the magic round this year. Mm. Um, Tane Milne smashed Jay Cavarillo in the face on Friday. Smashed him in the face. But Jay Cavarillo didn't want to get a HIA check, so he got up and played the ball. Yeah. Those ta- that tackle is ten- has, been, has been Tane Milne this year. Milne didn't even get charged. Yeah. We're guessing. We're completely guessing. And, and to underscore that is the fact that good old Graham Annesley, who's... Um, press releases or whatever they are, briefings that he does, I just cannot watch them because they're complete and utter waste of time. Everything he says doesn't get, in, doesn't get enforced on the weekend, but he came out and said that the NRL thought that the Sofa Solomona's hit on Makatoa was suspension worthy. And I'm like, hold yeah. on. So you're saying that it's suspension worthy, you can't do anything about it? Yeah, yeah. How I... does the NRL not have the power to come in and make a call over the match review committee? Yeah, well, I, yeah, well, I didn't know that Ennisley had said that, um, but, yeah. but, yeah, I wonder if they're just not willing to wield the power on the match review committee for making the match review committee seem weaker. If you know what I'm saying, like they, you know, they already they already weakened it as we've said it on the top. Well, they did, and I and I, that that was a really baffling thing for me. I mean, you know, I could understand maybe maybe them saying, all right, you know what, from from. Round one, we are going to wipe everyone's record, but we're going to restart the records. So everyone's on a clean slate starting from round one, okay? But going forward, we are now, you know, going to give everyone a chance to redeem themselves somewhat. Um, and uh, 
we'll go from there. You, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't, I know in a court of law that the jury aren't allowed to know what a person accused of something has done previously, but when it comes to sentencing, the judge knows. So, yep. you know, and there's obviously reason for that for preconceived ideas, blah, blah, blah. But we're talking about football here and, and, and there are certain players that do certain grubby things for leverage on other teams. And, and there are sometimes yep. victims of those things that are hobbling around for a few weeks, you know. Um, and, I, and I think that they, I think they should be held to account for those things. Um, not just given a clean slate every week, you know. I think I think that was silly. I'm I'm yeah. sorry, but I, I do think that was silly. Final point here on Annesley and that briefing. Uh, two weeks ago, he came out and said that players challenging, doing captains, giving away penalties to allow themselves to do yep. captains' challenges wasn't going to stand. Mm-hmm. A week later, he said exactly the same thing after it happened again on that weekend. Mm. Um, the Titans did something, didn't they? Oh, yeah, I just don't, like, what, why bother opening your mouth? That's, that's the long and the short of it. Pretty much this podcast, why bother opening your mouth? <laughs> uh, last, pod, last episode, I'll oh, the episode coming up in a second, and uh, some breaking news here on the Footy Show. Can't wait. Not the Footy Show. Sure. Let's have a look, and he goes, in the air, in the air, in the air. Have another look. What about that? Have another look. Does the point hit the ball? No, the, the point doesn't hit the ball. The ball's point hits the grass. Look, look, look. Yes. Oh. Yes. Look at that. Yes. Look at that. Yes. Rabbits, look at that. Can you believe it? We're back. Last segment here on the British Show. Thanks for sticking with us on 250. You've got a bumper edition, uh, which you were well and truly um, overdue for. Cox Smith, I have some bad news, mate. What is it? The great man blocked me. The great Gus Goulding. He blocked oh. me on Twitter. He blocked you? <laughs> he thought I was somebody else, evidently, because I haven't engaged him for like two weeks. What happened? And I went in, I went in this morning, just before we got on the pod, Mm-hmm. And I'm going, why is Daryl Broman's tweet with Phil Gould not showing up on my feed? Yeah. And uh, the great man blocked me. Oh, you've been blocked. I've been, ice cold Gus has struck very close to Bang. home. Gone. Oh. So I reckon, Gus, I, not that you listen. I reckon that, I reckon that would have been like playing Gus back in the 80s. You would have just been traveling along in the game, then bang. You would have felt a, a, a. There's absolutely no reason for him to have punted me. Um, well, he doesn't. Even, he does, doesn't follow me. I, as I said, I haven't engaged with him for ages. Um, yep. And I, there are a couple of accounts out there called NRL something because it's the NRL tweet account, which has been around for over a decade now. Yep. But I'd say he's he's gone through and he's seen it come up in a feed, and he thought I was somebody else. I would say because I had a few things that I posted yesterday, which were just happy things about the Tigers. Mm. Um, that other people had retweeted, and I'm sure he thought I was somebody he'd already blocked. And um, you've I, been blocked, just, mate. You're out. The f- hilarious thing about the old Gus and blocking people because he'd often go up against people about why you follow me, goodbye, etc. <laughs> is that people do have other accounts, and so I'm just following him by another account. So we will know um, <laughs> if Gus listens to this show if my other account gets blocked. Yeah, I'm fairly sure, I'm fairly confident Gus does not listen to this show, but let me let me just maybe throw you some advice because I'm you know I'm, I'm, I regularly uh, converse with the great man. Oh, you love the Gus. You are the Gus. You want to be Gus. Yeah. Yes. So tell me, why don't you from one of your other accounts? Why don't you just say, hey Gus, uh, just just let you know, mate. Yeah, maybe maybe it was a misunderstanding, or maybe it was a you know fat fingers moment. But you've seemed to have blocked my other account for some reason and. Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. No, not gonna happen. <laughs> you know, you Some, somehow, I don't think that would be good news for my other account. Um, <laughs> knowing I'll Gus, he know. wouldn't want to say he, would, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't want to say he's wrong. He, he'd just punt the other account as well and shut that up um, in classic Gus fashion. Uh, mm. Speaking of Gus, um, 
I make Six no comments Gus on coach. Gus. Okay, I'm not making any derogatory comments on Gus. You can talk about him <laughs> commentating. I, I love Gus. You, everyone knows I love Gus. Um, but he's got a new co-host. Grace has gone to the Channel 9 news desk. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, looking resplendent there in his um, suit and tie. And uh, Gus has a new co-anchor. And my nephew sent me a message um, the day before you sent me a message, which was basically, we miss Bracey. That's the nicest way I can say it. Um, <laughs> Tomo, Tomo is, is making some ears bleed, apparently, and there's a theory going around that he's also making Gus's ears bleed. Um, I used to listen to that show regularly. I didn't listen to it all the time, but, you know, and one of the things that Gracie did really well, he would set up Gus and let Gus talk. Um, Tomo apparently is not quite as good at doing that. Mm. Yeah, Tomo likes, I think Tomo likes the sound of his own voice. Um, and, you know, look, I'm not sure whether Gus dislikes him or is annoyed by him, or if it's just a, you know, maybe in a, in a pre-production meeting and during the year they've probably thought, you know, we need a little bit more uh, agitation, a little bit more conflict in this podcast. So maybe you guys can brawl it out a little bit. I'm not sure. But it seems that 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 Thompson gets under Gus's skin a little more than mm. Brace used to. Yeah, it's, it's got me turning off a lot of things at the moment. Oh. I, I made a threat wow. the other day wow. that um, I would mute uh, Michael Ennis doing Parramatta games because um, <laughs> I just couldn't hack it any longer. He so long and short of it, everybody is that he is now an assistant coach at the Eagles. Uh, he's moved on from the Raiders after... Who, Ennis? Um, Ennis, right? Ennis, yeah. yeah, Michael Ennis. And he did a game uh, a few weeks back. I'm not sure who was it against. I think it was the Melbourne game and he was pretty insufferable, but I went, look, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And he did um, the Titans game last weekend and I didn't get past half time. I couldn't deal with it. I just had to turn it off. Something else on. <laughs> He does the game yesterday, the Easter Monday game, and I've walked into the kitchen to put something in the oven, and I've had Fox on, and I couldn't last longer than three minutes. He's screaming at the te- at the te- through the television at how good Parramatta are. They're the greatest team in the history of mankind. Um, he's talking about next man up and all this kind of stuff. I just couldn't do it. I said, look, okay, I've, I've said to myself I'm going to mute but I'll go one better. I'll actually do the old school thing where you put a radio on and then you sync it to the TV. That's how my, that's the lengths I was willing to go to get rid of Michael Ennis from like my, my life. And it worked a treat. Yep. I listened to 2GB. It was um, David Morrow and um, Roman with Riddell on the sideline. Yep. And it was, it took a bit of pausing and whatever to, to sync up, but it was so refreshing to hear radio commentary again versus the product produced out of the yin yang stuff that's on on fox and nine at the moment um it was a really refreshing thing to do fox smith and if you're out there people if you want to do it for a standalone game i recommend it now you can listen whoever you want there's a bunch of places that do it on the radio now uh but it was extremely refreshing now it doesn't mean i don't like all commentators on those channels that's all i'm saying yeah. it's just after you watch as much football as i do um there's a list going longer and longer of the people that I find it really hard to listen to. Well, maybe um, this maybe this is an opportunity for us in the future. Maybe we can get someone to stream a live podcast to their stereo or what it may be, their Walkman at home, and um, and listen to us commentate a game while the TV... I would love to do that. We'd have to do it in the same, same place, I imagine. Of course we would. Um, <laughs> as much as it's fun to... To be talking over great distances. Come to Camden, um, I'll but, cook you some pulled pork. Oh, very good. But yeah, there's some there's some shockers on there at the moment, and oh, just making it hard. I mean, you got the Sleep Doctor, CP13, Brenton. I'll tell you and read his life story every time I take <laughs> you. You just speed. you just make um, nicknames up from all. You cannot and, call and Thompson. The other, so Thompson was doing the the Sunday game, was it? Mm. And I decided I'll, I'll see who I want to listen to because. I think it was Brandy and somebody else. I think it was Brandy and Bossy possibly doing the Sunday Saints game. I thought, I'll see what's on Channel 9. And I put the TV across Channel 9 and left it on for a minute. And you did not know that there was anybody else in the commentary box except for Tomo. Yeah. He was Listen, answering, I... asking, and asking himself questions, answering them, telling you everything <laughs> that you didn't want to know. Um, I have and, an issue. Uh, yeah, I have an issue with you calling the great Greg Alexander Brandy the sleep doctor. I've got a big, big issue with that. Not only is he a is it, former great. Is it great, not accurate? Is that what you're telling me? Or is not there only is he a former great, but he's also a member of the board of the magnificent Penrith Panthers, and you are calling him the sleep doctor. Explain yourself. <laughs> you 
<laughs> explain yourself. Every time he commentates, he sends you to sleep. He's a genius. I cannot, I cannot go at that. I, I I don't endorse that. I'm sorry, Brandy, if you listen. I'm sure you don't. Yeah, you've been you've been calling that with me for years. That's I have great. not. I have Captain not. Snooze was the other option. Was either Captain <laughs> Snooze or the sleep doctor. I, I do giggle one. every time I hear you say it because I'm not sure anyone knows who you're talking about. But uh, let's just call him Brandy from now on. The sleep doctor's I'm working derogatory. hard. I'm working hard. Benji's been a good addition to Fox. I yeah, he's he said right. something the other week um, that I really liked, but it got shut down pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was talking about uh, how to run a, run a game, basically, and he said he didn't learn how to do that until he was 30. Yep. Um, and yet here we are on the Fox panel digging into guys like Sammy Walker and Toby Sexton after four first grade games. They don't know how to run a game. It yeah. is very, very refreshing. Um, it leaves us finally with our um, Faith in Braith, Braith and Asta. Also, Cameron Munster's manager, if you didn't know, if you've watched any of the broadcasts of late. Um, like apparently, Andrew Webster's done a story this morning about is it okay for an Asta to be um, hosting TV coverage if he's also the manager of one of the players that he's covering. And that basically leads us back to the Ennis question. Should he be doing Parramatta games? Should Gus be doing Bulldogs games? Um, because Gus did say on Friday he was very critical of the referees giving South the leg up. But having said that, the Bulldogs were trying a tactic to get themselves in the game. I didn't mind them having a crack at that. Other referees might let him get away with it. Um, that's the decision that they've got to make, I guess, when they sit down and formulate game plans. But should those two in particular be doing those games you reckon at the moment or not oh, I, look I reckon it's hard for them to, to do those games yeah. and be impartial um, you know we, we all we all kind of um, you know stick our stick our colours on the on the pole and, and you know wear our hearts on our sleeves and all those all the rest of the you know sayings it's really hard it, you've, you've got you've got a horse in the race and, it, and it's hard to be to be um, to be impartial so I yeah, yep. I I think it's probably easier for them if they don't do those games. But if the if the producer or the executive producer who's you know handing out the the games for the week puts them on, well then, you know maybe it's maybe it's in the best interest of the TV guys, the, the guys that are making the decisions not to put them on those games. There's plenty of other games to do. Um, or is it about the fact that it's there? That well, that's, that's sitting in the background. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm, uh, maybe they maybe those. Producers who are making those decisions think, "Oh, this will make good TV because Gus has got an insight into to Canterbury here." But I think whatever insight Gus has got, Gus has been around the you know around the traps for a long, long time. He's not going to be giving away any secrets or anything like that. No. He'll probably be able to give you a little bit of insight into some personalities and whatnot, but he's not going to give you anything other than that. I mean, Gus is two humans, you know, the, the human that's that's uh, the media Gus, and then there's the football Gus, and they're very different. Um, yep. And you know, yeah, I've 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 seen Gus around football, as far as a football administrator goes, and and um, uh, he's he's very different to what he's like in front of the camera or behind the mic. So um, yeah. I don't think you're going to see too much of that. But what you will get is you'll get a you'll get a biased conversation about how the game's going or how the referees are going. going. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I don't think it's such a good idea, but. It, it can't hurt anybody, but is it is it a is it a good idea? Maybe not. Big differences between the two styles. Gus talks when he feels like it, not when he has to, but when he feels like it. Yeah. When he does commentary, whereas Ennis does not shut up. Ennis <laughs> has to be always talking. Well, and, maybe uh, Matt Thompson, that, maybe Matt Thompson and Ennis could get in the booth together. <sighs> well, to give you an indication of how dominant Ennis is, he makes it sound like Bossy's the co-commentator. Yeah. Well, maybe that's his plan. Okay. Maybe he's got a plan, and maybe it's working. Oh, uh, well. Uh, there was a couple of tweets out yesterday. I'm Michael Ennis. I wouldn't be going on Twitter uh, this morning. There were some very uh, savage comments about his commentary style. Really? Uh, in, particular, in particular, the volume of which he does his commentary. He, he oh. sits at a desk, and he speaks very much like this, and this is the team, and the, but then he gets into commentary, and it's just uh, decibel. He, he decibels. roars. Oh, well. Um, that's the podcast, everybody. Episode 250. Rob Cox, thanks for your company, sir. No worries, mate. Thanks for uh, you pulling your finger out, basically, and making this happen. <laughs> if only no, I'm just as true. much to blame. I've, I've, do, I've yeah. had a lot of uh, We will speak to you next time. Uh, probably, yeah. Look, we say it every time, but maybe if something comes up, we'll jump on. We will try and do that. Um, we should put, bit, moment, should put a bit more effort in, mate. mate you know? We should. We should. 
We'll see um, how we go. But at the moment, that's what you get. 250 in the bag. I've been working so Matt's been Rob Cox. You can get us on a whole bunch of different places. Um, I've advertised them plenty enough times for you to find it. If you want to give us an iTunes review or a podcast review, that would be great. Um, if not, if you've enjoyed having us back, just send us a note. Uh, via Twitter at Enerol Tweet, not that Gus will be sending me anything there, and uh, on Instagram at Not The Footy Show. And we will speak to you next time on this show that uh, Coxsmith describes as... Pepsi. Not The Footy Show. Show? You've been sleeping over there. Pepsi.